Welcome to Channel 17, the Town of Colony Government Channel. Professor Brannigan wrote a, wrote a little article in the Sunday perspective section about reading. He mentioned this book. So he teaches ethics and moral values down at the College of St. Rose. He's also affiliated with the, um, down at Albany Med, the March Center. They do biomedical ethics. I think his background's in biomedical ethics, mm -hmm. which I think would be really interesting for the internet, because I don't think he's a computer expert or a brain expert. So this will give us a nice take on on this to tell us about the shallows, what the internet is doing to our brains. I love that title. So. Okay, thank you. Thanks. I've got books here. As you can see, I brought books with me. I can envision a time in the future when father will be bringing his son somewhere and they'll be looking at these relics. You know what I'm saying? And the son will be saying, what's that, Dad? And the father will say, well, you know, son, those are books. They used to call them books. Uh, <laughs> I, bought, I brought a few with me. But first, let me thank Joe for inviting me here. That's very kind of you, uh, Joe, and I appreciate that. This is my first time in the library. and very impressed. So that's nice, good size. It's great to see you all. And it's great to see that people still go to the library. On our campus, the library is the quietest place on campus. And it's not because people are, students are seriously reading quietly. Huh? Now, let me uh, first ask you, how many here have read Carr's book, Nicholas Carr's book, The Shallows? One gentleman? OK. It's worth reading. I highly recommend. Oh, two. Oh, three of you. OK. Well, I highly recommend it. Uh, there are issues in there that I take, there are question, points in there that I, ta I take issue with, but that's all right. I mean, I think, uh, I think it's, uh, it's, it's a landmark work, and I think the sign of a landmark work is that it will elicit commentary, uh, visceral response, thoughtful response, and, and, and whatever. So I highly recommend the book by Nicholas Carr. Hopefully it'll come in paperback someday. Right now, I think it's still only in hardbound, isn't it? Uh, yeah. I have th a few other books with me. One is uh, some writings by Nietzsche, Friedrich Nietzsche, one of my favorite philosophers. I have uh, Jean-Jacques Rousseau's Confessions, which he wrote just before he died. He died in 1778. And I also have the German version of the first volume of Der Zauderberg, The Magic Mountain, by Thomas Mann. And I referred to Thomas Mann in my, my article this past Sunday in the Times Union because inmates at Bergen-Belsen concentration camp uh, were sharing and passing around very secretively a copy of this book, all worn out. And there was only one copy. It's banned. It was banned in 1924. And it, it was published in 1924. It was banned during the Second World War. So these prisoners were passing this around. And they absolutely cherished the book, the feel of the book, the feel of the pages, the incredible memory and wisdom inside the book, the story. the lesson it teaches, the hope that it gave. And for prisoners, it really was their, their handle to make it through the days in Bergen-Belsen. Now, I can't imagine passing around a Kindle and having the prisoners feel the same way. Maybe I'm wrong. Maybe we can envision a Bergen-Belsen in the future where that might be the case, but I doubt it. because. The book, with its cover to cover and pages, becomes our own, becomes our friend.
becomes ours. It rescues our memory. It gives us hope. And it's uh, certainly, in my opinion, the cornerstone of our culture and civilization. And what Carr writes about in his book is the, the probable demise of the book in the future, in the not too far future. Uh, there are less and less people going to libraries. Readership in newspapers is falling drastically. More people read the online versions. Newspapers are changing their headlining so that commentaries are quick, easy, filled with more graphics, USA Today style. Even in New the New York Times, you you'll see a change over the past 10 years. Commentaries in the New York Times are a lot briefer. They're not as extended. It's, uh, it's an interesting time we're in. And Carr grabs the bull by the horns here in addressing the key issue. Well, if we're not going to read books anymore, if we're forced to read more online, how will this affect the way we read? And more importantly, how will this affect the way we think? So I'm going to talk about, I think, three main features in the book, three ideas. I'll break it down. And then we can open it up for questions afterwards. Is that all right? We can do that? First of all, one of the key ideas here in the book is what he calls deep reading. This is not his term. This is a term that Harold Bloom, a Yale scholar, Shakespearean scholar, talks about in, uh, in a book that I would recommend. Uh, it's a fabulous book. It's called How to Read and Why by Harold Bloom. And he gives a wonderful, wonderful illustration of the richness of reading, deep reading, and he uses uh, characters and fiction and nonfiction and literature. So it's, it's a really wonderful book, How to Read and Why. Deep reading. Deep reading is something I think we all know. We all know. It's when we are immersed in the book, when we live the book, when we are fully engaged in the book, when we are attentive and focused in the story. When we learn about ourselves and discover ourselves in the process of that. And all of that requires attention, focus, and engagement. Now try to imagine reading The Magic Mountain and working on a crossword puzzle at the same time. That's the image the car gives us of the difficulty of reading today, if we're reading online, because we are bombarded with stimuli from all different directions. Now, defenders of the stimuli will say the hyperlink is a good thing, because a hyperlink leads us to other references. And it's sort of a substitute for a footnote or an endnote in a book. But something about online hyperlinks, according to Carr, they do not only direct us to a source, they almost propel us to that source. And then we skip to another hyperlink within that hyperlink. And then before you know it, we've already sustained, we've already lost the attention that we had hoped to have at the original, at the beginning. You see, so if we think of the rabbit hole, Alice in Wonderland, and being dragged into that rabbit hole of distraction and diversion. And that's what the uh, surfing around and hyperlinking can bring about. Now, Carr isn't saying that that's necessarily always going to be the case for all of us. But that tends to be the case generally when we read online. So reading online is distractive. Reading online uh, can interrupt our attention. Now, let me read to you the beginning of Jean-Jacques Rousseau, just to 
illustrate how the attention that the book reading here, how that requires our own focus. Jean-Jacques Rousseau, is it, he starts off, I have entered on a performance which is without example, whose accomplishment will have no imitator. I mean to present my fellow mortals with a man in all the integrity of nature, and this man shall be myself. I know my heart. I've studied mankind. I'm not made like anyone I have been acquainted with, perhaps like no one in existence. And if not better, I at least claim originality. And whether nature did wisely in breaking the mold with me can only be determined after having read this work. Whenever the last trumpet shall sound, I shall present myself before the sovereign judge with this book in my hand and loudly proclaim, thus have I acted. These were my thoughts. Such was I. That requires getting into the text. That requires becoming Rousseau. That requires imagining our own confession. Carr's argument is that online reading militates against that, that kind of engagement. He cites one of the beautiful poems by Wallace Stevens. I'm going to read part of the poem. And he cites this poem because Wallace Stevens, the poet, writes about reading and writes about deep reading. And the name of his poem is The House Was Quiet and the World Was Calm. It's all about reading, deep reading. The house was quiet and the world was calm. The reader became the book. And summer night was like the conscious being of the book. The house was quiet and the world was calm. The words were spoken as if there was no book, except that the reader leaned above the page, wanted to lean, wanted much to be most the scholar to whom his book is true, to whom the summer night is like a perfection of thought. The house was quiet because it had to be. The quiet was part of the meaning, part of the mind, the access of perfection to the page. It's a beautiful description of the experience of reading. Finding our own inner quiet away from the turmoil. As Bloom puts it, reading is an absolutely solitary experience. There's no ethics in reading. It's a solitary experience. Where we're engaged in what it is we read. And the quiet. Online reading, in contrast, is disquieting, according to Carr. Disquieting because we have scrawls, ads, RSS feeds, Twitter alerts, email messages. The content becomes commodified, and the content becomes decontextualized without context. And then we go and jump from hyperlink to hyperlink. Now, he uses the metaphor of this experience. He uses the metaphor of the thimble and the tub. Reading online versus reading a book. Imag now I'm reading from Carr. Imagine filling a bathtub with a thimble. That's the challenge involved in transferring information from working memory into long-term memory. By regulating the velocity and intensity of information flow, 
media exert a strong influence on this process. When we read a book, the information faucet provides a steady drip, which we can control by the pace of our reading through our single-minded concentration on the page, on the text, we can tra transfer all or most of the information, thimbleful by thimbleful, into long-term memory and forge the rich associations needed. With online reading, however, we face many information faucets, all going full blast. Our little thimble overflows as we rush from one faucet to the next. We're able to transfer only a small portion of the information to long-term memory. And what we do transfer is a jumble of drops from different faucets, not a continuous coherent stream from one source. It's a wonderful image. You think of a thimble from one faucet. Reading a book, you have the single faucet, and you're steadily pouring the water from the, from the faucet into the thimble, into the tub. Online reading, we have many faucets going on at once, some going faster than others. And we're taking the, the thimble and trying to disperse the water into the tub. An interesting example of what he calls cognitive overload is when we're bombarded with more stimuli than we need and such stimuli takes us away from the, intention, from the attention. He also calls, uh, there's research studies here. Uh, there's a couple of, uh, in Stanford and Cornell and other places have, have analyzed students and studied students' habits reading online versus reading a book. And the results of the research, and this was published by the Nielsen Norman Consulting Group, was that Online readers, well, the question is, how do online readers read? The answer they say is they don't. Online readers skim, scan, in the pattern of an F. So the top part of the page we skim, or we scan, but towards the bottom half of the page, we sort of skip over. We miss out on all the details. Now, Neil, Neil, Nielsen Norman Group, they're a consulting group that helps companies establish websites. So the moral of that story is, if you're going to print anything important on your website, don't put it on the bottom half of your page, because most of us won't look at the bottom half of our pages. And even at the top part of our pages, we'll only skim the surface of that. So it's very interesting. So this sort of F. F approach, F for fast, uh, way of reading, which, according to Carr, is not really reading. So deep reading is certainly one of the key ideas in the book. Theme number two is the evidence for that. The evidence for that, he then unearths neuroscientific studies. And there's quite a bit of evidence from neuroscience today, the study of neural mechanisms, the study of the brain. And what neuroscientists have discovered recently is that the brain is, not cons is, not, is no longer thought of as a fixed entity. After a certain age, it was thought that the brain develops in a certain way, and then after adolescence, it pretty much stays in that fixed way of thinking. And the neural synapses, etc., they sort of stay in that fixed pattern. Neuroscientists recently point out that the brain is uh, plastic. It adjusts. It continually adjusts to situations. Uh, and uh, a very interesting uh, bit of research is by uh, Italian researchers uh, Iacoboni, Marco Iacoboni, he's write, written a book on mirror neurons. I would recommend that. It's a very interesting book because the whole idea of mirror neurons is that there are neurons in our brain which mirror other people's activity and behavior. And even if the person's not there, the very imagining of that changes the neural patterning of the way we think. Now, what does this have to do with online reading? Well, according to Carr, online reading is such 
that the neural patterning in that F patterning will affect a certain part of our brain. And when we're leaping from hyperlink to hyperlink, we're in a sense being imposed upon to make decisions as to whether or not we go to this hyperlink or to, or to that, rather than to sustain the attention needed to be engaged in the actual text. Do you understand that? So instead of actually reading, we're decision, we're judging, or evaluating, or decoding. And we're going from one hyperlink to the other. That requires that part of our brain, which controls the decoding process, and undermines that part of our brain that controls deep reading. So that's quite interesting. The uh, let me read this one passage here. So the potential for unwelcome neuroplastic adaptations also exists in the everyday normal functioning of our minds. Experiments show that just as the brain can build new or stronger circuits through physical or mental practice, those circuits can weaken or dissolve with neglect. So in other words, if we don't use that part of our brain, which is responsible for deep reading, then that part of our brain decays. It's, it's a sort of intellectual decay taking place when, we're, when we replace book reading with online reading. You see, so the effect that that has in our thinking and the way we think about thinking of course, that's a little more philosophical question, isn't it? How do we think about thinking? Uh, what is thinking? Who decides what is progress with respect to thinking? If we stop exercising our mental skills, we do not just forget them, the mental skills involved in reading. The brain maps space for those skills is turned over to the skills we practice instead. When it comes to the quality of our thought, our neurons and synapses are entirely indifferent. The possibility of intellectual decay is inherent in the malleability of our brains. So just think about that. In our brains, when you have at least 100 billion neurons, and for each neuron, there are, there are attachments. You have an axon and you have dendrites, many dendrites, the one axon. So the firing of the synapses, there's a certain firing that takes place. So if I were to, for instance, imagine a musical piece by Rachmaninoff without playing it, that would have a certain patterning of our brain, in my brain. If I were to play that, on the piano, that would have a certain patterning in our brain. What neuroscientists discover is that the very imagining of that playing that piece could, fire, could have the same neuronal pattern firing of synapses within my brain, which is fascinating. But what's interesting is while we're online, what part of the brain are we using? And more importantly for Carr, what part of the brain are we not using? See, and that's the, t that's the, that's the issue. Uh, and I'm always a, I'm of the opinion, I've, I tell them my, to my students, that technology is wonderful. We are inherently technical. We inherently make things. Homo faber, man the maker. We make things. But for every technology, there's an amputative process. For every giving, there's a taking. We surrender something. So we uh, have something that allows us to approach something with more convenience. We also surrender something in the process. And this now brings us to the third theme. But before I get into that, let me first point out another study, and this is much more specific, of students uh, who are presented with classroom material in Cornell. Students were divided into two groups. One group was allowed to surf the web while listening to a lecture. A log of their activity showed that they looked at sites related to the lecture's content, but they also visited unrelated sites. 
checked their email, went shopping, watched videos, and did all the other things that people do online. All right, that's the one group of students. The second group heard the identical lecture, but had to keep their laptop shut. Very anxiety, a lot of anxiety in that. <laughs> Immediately afterwards, both groups took a test measuring how well they could recall the information from the lecture. The surfers, the researchers report at Cornell, performed significantly poorer on immediate measures of memory for the to be learned content. Another study, Kansas State University, very similar. They had a group of college students watch a typical CNN broadcast in which an anchor reported four news stories while various infographics flashed on the screen and a textual news scroll ran along the bottom. We've seen that, right? You're watching the news and you're seeing scrolls and everything. They had a second group of students watch the same programming but without the graphics and the news scroll. They were stripped out. Subsequent tests found that the students who watched the multi multimedia version remembered significantly fewer facts from the stories than those who watched the simpler version. So I've tried that with my own students, my own students. I'll give a lecture, and students ask me right at the way at the beginning of course, can they bring their laptops? And I always say, no, you can't bring your laptops. In fact, anything that has an on and off device can you, it has to be off. And they're puzzled by that. Uh, they can't get it. Uh, no cell phones. I have them turn all their cell phones off, uh, place their hands on the desk, <laughs> pen and paper. I'm the old-fashioned, and I tell, I tell, I explain to them, I'm of the old-fashioned school that you have to have a pen or pencil and paper and listen and take notes. And for a lot of them, that is an absolutely foreign, alien experience. They, don't, they just can't fathom the idea of taking notes, number one. And a lot of them feel left out not having their laptops or their cell phones. It's sort of like a vital organ, you know. The, we're going to, uh, in the future, we'll have organ transplants and we'll be transplanting cell phone devices. Uh, but I, I insist that they do not have these on because from past experience, students have had laptops in classrooms and they would, uh, testing after testing, even though they claimed that they were pursuing further the ideas that I was talking about in class, they did poorly on their exams. Now, whether they actually did that, who knows, but I know, I know that some students were uh, going into other sites. In fact, I caught one student in, on a porn site. So, I had to, so that was, that was dis, dis, dissettling. Uh, but I, I'm, pretty, I'm pretty tough on that in my classrooms. Uh, and I'm trying to, try to, trying to convey to them that learning is, a, is an active experience. It's taking notes, but it's not taking notes verbatim. It's listening to what's being said, digesting it, and then, ta and then writing down. And that's what it's all about, especially in my, in my courses in ethics because ethics is all about reflection, deliberation, you know. And I always kind of tend to go back. I, I, I kind of give, give my lectures in a circular fashion. I always go back to the same point. So it's not minutia or data that they have to write down, but listening. And that's, that's critical, listening. So reading is sort of a listening. It requires the same sort of intention, attention, where we're in a dialogue, we're listening, we're engaged, we're living the book. Now, a third theme that this brings us to, and what, uh, what's good about this book is that even though the main theme is about book reading versus online reading, there's always the underlying major theme. And the underlying major theme is really about how we relate to our technologies how we relate to our tools. And that, to me, is the third very important theme in Carr's book. How do we relate to our tools? 
It's no surprise that our culture especially is driven by what we call, by what, by what scholars have called, the technological imperative. Have you heard of that expression before? The technological imperative? It's very prominent in healthcare. In other words, we have the MRI, we have the technologies, so what good is it unless we use them? So the inherent value of the technique lies in its application. And that makes sense because we are a very pragmatic culture. We value things in terms of their application <clears throat> and their usefulness. <clears throat> the problem lies when we overuse the technologies and when technological intervention becomes a substitute for interpersonal intervention. And that occurs a lot in healthcare, is when the technological intervention replaces the human-to-human -human intervention that's just as important, if not more important, in many cases. So we're driven by that technological imperative. So Chicago, for instance, Chicago hospitals, the use of MRIs, magnetic resonance Im imaging machines, uh, is more than the entire country or continent of Australia. All right, now, what does that mean? Does that mean that the Australians are not as technologically advanced as we are in, 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 in healthcare? Not necessarily, because there's a distinction between maximal use of our technologies and optimal use of our technologies. And unless we may, uh, realize that distinction, uh, we'll continue to overuse technologies. And, and, and as we know, there are many reasons why this is the case, defensive medicine, medical litigation, et cetera, why we tend to overuse and rely on medical technologies. And the danger, of course, lies when that becomes, or that replaces the human-to-human -human intervention and presence in healthcare. We don't hear too much about healing these days in healthcare, but healing is a very important part of healthcare. So there's this myth of moral neutrality that Carr alludes to. And there are two schools of thought in this. All right, here's my cell phone. I've got an old fashioned one, by the way. This is really an old fashioned one. It's, at least it's not a big one. I remember when cell phones first came out, they were called car phones. And they were really big clunkers, really ugly looking things. And, and I was playing tennis one day. It was a hot August, after, August day, and I was in Baskin Robbins. And I was with my buddy. We just played tennis, and we're all sweating. We're waiting for ice cream. And these high school girls in front of us, they were saying they would never date a guy who didn't have a car phone. So I'm thinking, oh my god. Uh, they're probably going to be students at the school. I mean, my students next semester or something. So I shared this with my, my class uh, at, when the fall semester started. This was down in Westchester County, where I, st I started teaching in Westchester County. So I mentioned this to my class. So the week, a week afterwards, one of the students came up to me with a car phone, because you could buy fake car phones then. <laughs> It was $9.99. You could buy a fake car phone. You can, in other words, you could stop at the red light and pull out your fake car phone and pretend, pretend that you're important, you know, and that you're, you're right there on the cutting edge. So anyway, so we've gone a long way from car phones to these little things. But after my classes, they're out there. So they're walking down Western Avenue car zipping by, you know? It's an accident waiting to happen. <laughs> totally unaware. Totally unaware of spring, nature, whatever. But uh, the, atta the attachment that we have to these is just incredible. So there is two schools of, two schools of thought. One is the instrumental school, is that, look, at technology is an instrument. It's all how we use it. That's the instrumental school of thought, basically. We're in control. Technologies is ours for us to control and to use for our own purposes. That's the instrumental school of thought. The other is the deterministic school of thought, 
that claims that technology actually is determining how we behave, you see. Cars uh, is sort of in the middle. And I think that's a nice, healthy balance. I think it's naive to, to just assume that technology is simply neutral. There's nothing neutral about an F-16. There's, no there's a sort of moral underpinning in the technologies. But certainly, a lot of it is within our control and within our grasp and our responsibility as to how we allow these tools to think for us. And that, that's the danger. Once we start allowing our tools, intellectual tools like the internet, computers, once we start allowing them to think for us, then we've surrendered our intelligence. Do you remember the scene from Space Odyssey 2001? Or do, you, do you remember this, that classic movie, Space Odyssey 2001? 2001 was what, <laughs> 10 years ago, <laughs> almost nine years ago. Uh, Stanley Kubrick, uh, it's a great scene. Is that that's with Hal. And that's how, <laughs> that's how Carl starts the book. Hal, Hal is being dismantled because he's malfunctioning. He's the computer on this, on this plane, on this, on this spaceship that's going to, to a planet. Meanwhile, the, uh, the, uh, the humans are in some sort of s some, uh, sleep, sleep state, except for a few. But what's interesting in the film is that the humans are very machine-like. They show very little or no emotion. Hal, on the other hand, as he's being dismantled, starts saying, I can feel it. I can feel it. Stop. Stop. The machine starts feeling. Humans in the film are more like the machine. You see? That's the big switch that Carr talks to about in an earlier work is that our relationship with our machines, with our tools, is critical. Once we allow the machine to take over, then we've ceded, we've surrendered our humanness. This is why Mary Shelley's book is, will always be a classic, Frankenstein. It's always a classic work by Mary Shelley. You've read that, Frankenstein, right? Our creation. When our creation takes us over. Now, Nietzsche, Nietzsche started going blind towards the end of his uh, last few decades of his life. And he started writing on a Mauling Hansen ball writer, which was the progenitor, progenitor of the typewriter. And he was one of the first to use that. And even Nietzsche's friends felt that Nietzsche's writing underwent a change before he was writing everything in longhand. The machine, however, enabled him or somehow affected his writing style and probably his writing process and thinking behind the writing process because behind the writing process, there's a thinking process. So uh, let me read uh, the, the first part of his book. Beyond Good and Evil, which was written in 1886. This was four years after his vision started deteriorating and when he started using the machine, more so. And he starts off the book, the will to truth, which is to tempt us to many a hazardous exp expertise, the famous truthfulness of which all philosophers have hitherto spoken with respect, what questions? has this will to truth not laid before us? What strange, perplexing, questionable questions? It's already a long story, yet it seems as if it were hardly commenced. Is it any wonder? Is it any wonder we grow distrustful? Is it any wonder about losing patience and turn impatiently away that this sphinx teaches us at last to ask questions ourselves? Who is it that puts these questions to us here? I won't go on. But you see, 
what the style there, his friend pointed out that his style is much choppier. You have shorter sentences. That's possible in German. <laughs> you have shorter sentences. Very different from Nietzsche's earlier writings, which were longer, prosaic, almost unending sentences. So his friend detected that his writing style changed once he started using the, the typewriter. And what Carr points out is that that, well, they may, that may well reflect a change not just in his style, but in his thinking. How do we relate to our tools? Uh, one of the miracles of the internet online reading is the interactive background. But it may well be the case that interactive has changed in significance. What do we mean by interactive? For the online reader, when clicking affords the identity, then we have a shift in thinking. See, a shift from Descartes' I think, therefore I am, to I click, therefore I exist. <clears throat> so what do we think about thinking? Heidegger, German philosopher, foresaw this early on. And Carr ends his book with a quote from Heidegger. He says, in the 1950s, Martin Heidegger observed that the looming tide of technology could so captivate, bewitch, and dazzle us that calculative thinking, decoding, may someday come to be accepted and practiced as the only way of thinking. Our ability to engage in meditative thinking or reflection, which Heidegger saw as the very essence of our humanity, might become a victim of headlong progress. The tumultuous advance of technology could, like the arrival of the locomotive at the Concord Station, drown out the refined perceptions, thoughts, and emotions that arise only through contemplation and reflection. The frenziness of technology, Heidegger wrote, threatens to entrench itself everywhere. So interacting does not mean the same as connecting. And here's the, here's the irony, at least in my opinion. The irony is that with all, our, all of our technology of, technologies of connecting, the paradox is that we become less connected. So we have the technologies of connecting, but we've gradually become more disconnected with each other. And by that, we become less present with each other. It's what I think of as the virtue of presence, being with the other. When high school students or teenagers send, on an average, how many text messages a month? 2,272 that they send or receive. Send or receive. Each one? On the average. I'm sure you have some teenagers who don't send any. You have some who really send a lot. <laughs> but on average, and this was a 2008 study, on average, 2,272 text messages a month. OK. The question is, what are they not doing? What's the time that could be spent? What are they not doing? What, part of that, what they're not doing is actually going on their bike or go, going to see their buddy or their friend and being face-to-face -face and having a conversation. Face-to-face. Okay. -face. And that's what I mean by presence. Carr doesn't talk about it in his, in his book, but it remind, a lot of what he says reminds me of that, that notion of how we need so much to cultivate today more so than ever. What, what I think of as the virtue of presence, being with each other. Not to deny or diminish the importance of technology. To get me, get me, uh, don't get me wrong, I'm not a Luddite. 
I think technology, we are inherent makers. We make tools to make life better. But uh, that's the question. Is life better? And are we better for it? So shall we stop there? Uh, you're all sitting there. You know these Zen Buddhists said? Zen Buddhists said, don't just do something, sit there. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks a lot. Thanks for coming.